Hey, welcome to the Presbyterian Church of Lawrenceville Online. My name is Kyle and I'm one of the pastors here at the church. Whether you're a longtime member or friend of our congregation or a first time guest with us, we are so glad that you are joined, have joined us for worship this morning. Uh, we're online, uh, and so I encourage you to take advantage of that chat feature there to the right of your screen. Uh, if you're viewing this service on a mobile device, that chat feature will be down below. Someone from our church will be online during our live stream looking to engage with you. If you have any comments or concerns, prayer requests or needs, uh, we do encourage you to share those with us. Uh, we'll try to respond to all of those as they come in. You can use that chat feature for just such a thing. Uh, if you'd like, uh, you can also email any requests to our Associate for Pastoral Care Ministries, uh, Jill Cifelli. Uh, know that we continue to pray with and for one another. Uh, if you're sharing requests in the comments publicly, uh, just a reminder, please don't include last names uh, so that we can maintain one another's privacy. Engage with this service. Uh, use uh, the Facebook reactions as the service goes. Consider sharing your comments throughout the service. Like this post or share our video on Facebook. Even you might consider starting a watch party. It's never been easier to invite your friends and your family members to church. And so we encourage you uh, to do that. Also, sing loudly. All of the words to the songs that we'll include in our worship service will be there on the screen for you. So sing like nobody's watching. All right. And finally, several of you have asked about how you might support PCOL during these times. Uh, and it's never been easier to do that. We encourage you to visit our website, pclawrenceville.org. And there at the top right hand corner of the web page, you'll see a blue button labeled donate. Go ahead and click there and you can give a contribution to our church. Whether you're watching us live or you're catching up with us later in the week on Facebook or YouTube, we are so glad that you've decided to join us. And we look forward to worshiping God together. Good morning and welcome to worship at the Presbyterian Church of Lawrenceville. We're broadcasting live as we have done for the last year or so uh, from the meeting house of PCOL. So wherever you are, as you are, we're really glad that you're here. If you're here for the first time, we'd love to welcome you. Um, simply type your name in the chat if you're on Facebook or Zoom. We broadcast on both platforms. Uh, and by the way, at the end, I'm going to ask everybody actually to go over to the Zoom channel, but I'll get to that in just a minute. Welcome one and all. Uh, a few announcements before we begin our worship service. First of all, Stations of the Cross. Um, Jill and Alicia have put a ton of effort into creating what is an exceptionally creative Stations of the Cross this year, and that went live yesterday. Uh, it's a physical layout where you go to Stations of the Cross outside and around the grounds of the church. Um, if you, you'll need a cell phone to fully appreciate the, uh, the experience. Uh, it uses QR codes to direct you to websites where there's a multimedia experience. It is truly wonderful, and I would really urge everyone in the, in the congregation and anyone in the community uh, who might care to, uh, to do it. Uh, you can do one of the stations or a few at a time or all of them at the, at the same time. It's a really wonderful experience. Uh, stations of the Cross. I think there's more information also on our website if you wish to have that. Virtual choir. We can't do a live choir this Easter, but we're doing one simple, super simple piece and inviting anyone who can, uh, not, you don't even have to hold a tune, you just have to want to sing. And it's very simple. Uh, the instructions are on our website. All you need is a computer and a, and a camera uh, or a cell phone to record your voice and submit it for our virtual choir that will be then uh, lifted up and offered on Easter Sunday. 
Ode to Joy, everyone knows that tune. So please uh, sing with us and invite people from the community. The idea is that we try to recruit some new singers into our midst through that. And you can find out more via our website, pclawrenceville.org slash virtual, or just steer to our homepage and there's an article about it in the news section of our webpage. And I think it's right there on the homepage too. Um, flowers. One of the ways that we're raising funds is by <coughs> selling flowers that are sourced from Peterson's Nursery. Uh, you can order those online. We've got a really slick new uh, e-commerce store. You can buy them and then pick them up the day before Easter from 10 to 2 or on Easter Sunday. They'll be available, uh, a sort of honor system pickup uh, on Easter Sunday starting after the, the um, uh, the morning service, the sunrise service. Speaking of flowers, we invite everyone to once again contribute a flower to the Flowering Cross, and that will actually happen on Easter Sunday during our live uh, uh, sunrise service. Um, we're also going to be having a time of very simple time of fellowship after our 10 a.m. service. Uh, people can come, put a flower on the Flowering Cross, have fellowship. Um, you can stop by for a couple minutes and just say hello to your church neighbors after the 10 o'clock service on Easter. And if you can, uh, bring a flower. If not, one will be provided for you to put on the flowering cross. Adult Education, the um, Take It to the Lord in Prayer series continues Wednesday with Professor Dale Allison from Princeton Theological Seminary, who will be presenting a two-part series on prayer and magic, a fascinating subject. Uh, and so you will really want not to miss that. Wednesday, 7 o'clock to 7.30, a sort of very crisp half hour of adult education. And you can find out the Zoom link via our website. Please do tune in. Worship in a New Key, <clears throat> tonight at 5 o'clock. You can find the information about that. Uh, we're going to be coming together via Zoom. Uh, go to our Facebook page to find the Zoom information. Some celebrations today, one of them somewhat bittersweet, but the first purely joyful. Uh, Kay Yoder is just turning 100 years old. You can find information in the bulletin, and by the way, I encourage you to download the bulletin. I'm sure there's a link in the chat for you to download it, not only to follow along in the service, but to find out what's going on, and there's a lot going on. So Kay's address is in the bulletin if you want to send her a card, and that would be highly encouraged to congratulate her for a century of life. The other bittersweet celebration is for John Calkins, who has been our uh, paid soloist section leader for about a decade or more, um, and also is a church member, has joined the church a few years ago. Today is his last Sunday because he's becoming a choir director at a church. We'll be talking with him more about that after worship, and again, you're encouraged to move over to the Zoom channel where we'll have a brief time of celebration with John to mark his departure and celebrate his work with us. So please join us for that right after worship. Uh, each Sunday we uh, offer a moment for generous living and celebrating the way that people in this congregation are living generously as a way of reflecting their gratitude for God's generosity. And today's moment for generous living, this person doesn't know I'm lifting this up, but it's actually the wife of the person who is at our tech table there and has donated a lot of his time, Chris Allers, uh, to doing our tech on Sunday morning. But Sherry Allers, I want to lift her up. Um, Jill shared with me that she uh, let the deacons know that she wanted to write Valentine's cards to some of our, our shut-in members and uh, some of our people who uh, need a little boost. And so there she was, a woman who has like a thousand plates spinning at the same time as an educator and a parent and doing so many other things, writing uh, Valentine's cards as she was waiting for her son at soccer, at sorry, hockey practice early in the morning, sitting in her car writing Valentine's cards. I think that's a wonderful display of generosity, and we celebrate that as we celebrate God's generosity to us. We are generous people as followers of Christ, and so let us be inspired indeed uh, to live generously. A couple of updates on members uh, that uh, I would put under the category of sad news. Uh, we had two deaths in the congregation this past week, Pat McNelly and Dick Brown. Um, the services for both persons will be this coming Saturday, March 20th. Um, the service for Pat McNelly will be happening at 11 o'clock at Paulson and Van Heys. 
and the service for Dick Brown will be happening at Wilson Apple Funeral Home at 2 o'clock on Sunday, I'm sorry, on Saturday coming. And that information will be confirmed via email sometime soon. So please do download your bulletin for more announcements. You can certainly put links to announcements in the chat. Uh, but for now, let's have a, a moment to update the congregation about our plans for returning to in-person worship. It will happen at some point, and we're looking to that date, uh, but we're being as cautious and responsible about that as we can. So Chris Denny has a brief moment to share with you where we are with that. Good morning from your return to in-person activities team, RIPA. We've probably all heard use of the phrase light at the end of the tunnel again and again when scientists and government leaders reflect on the progress related to the response to the coronavirus. The twin phrase then seems to be, this is no time to let your guard down. We on the RIPA team, along with you, our members, celebrate the first and heed the second. Where does this leave us as a faith community? And what about Easter? Our members and community participants will be able to join in Easter celebration in one of two ways. The traditional Easter sunrise service will be held as usual in the graveyard, in person, with the appropriate physical distancing and mask requirement. We will also continue the tradition of the flowering cross and invite participants to bring a flower to adorn the cross. Family and household groups may come together to place flowers. Otherwise, we will welcome folks one at a time to the cross. We will have a hand sanitizer station set up nearby. The regular Sunday worship service on Easter will be available remotely at 10 a.m either using the Facebook Live or Zoom platforms. The RIPA team is exploring various forms of in-person worship and will meet after Easter to assess the situation. At present, we do not know the impact of the variants and the science is unknown about the degree to which vaccinated folks may be transmitters. Please be assured that we are doing all that we can to safely work toward in-person worship. Thank you.
Please join me in our call to worship. Before we were born, before we took our first breath, before the week started, before the year started, before we said, I love you, before we said, I'm sorry, before we figured out who we really are, before we figured out who we want to be, before it all, God loved us. Unconditionally and freely, fully and honestly, God loved us. Again and again, this is where our story begins. Let us worship God. Join me in our prayer of adoration and confession. Let us come to God in our need, in our trust that God will give us what we need. Let us pray. God of love, we forget the beginning of the story, that we were made from love to be love, to give love. Instead of rooting our narrative in the goodness reframe of creation, we skip ahead and find our worth at the fall, with Cain and Abel lost in the wilderness. We forget that first there was you and you are love. We forget that out of that love you created us. We forget that from the very first day you loved first. We forget because a love like that doesn't make sense to us. Forgive our low self-esteem. Forgive our resistance to love ourselves. Forgive our hesitation to trust that even we could be made good. And forgive our tendency to pass that doubt on from generation to generation. Write a new beginning for us that roots our confidence in your unrelenting love. With hope we pray again and again. Amen. Let us join together in our assurance of forgiveness. Family of faith, no matter what we do, where we go, or what we tell ourselves, God loves us, and God is loving us. God is love. Again and again, we are claimed, held, and forgiven. Not just some of us, but all of us. So in the name of the beloved and love itself, thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Can we all hear me? Okay. All right. Uh, now it's time for the children's message. So if you are a child of God, now is the time where I would invite you to come a little bit closer to the TV or a laptop or phone, whatever screen you are watching this on, 
Come on in a little bit closer. That's it. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Rachel, and today we are going to be zooming in on one particular verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. Now, here's my Bible. Uh, you can see it. It has a black cover. Um, and I would say this is a pretty big book. Um, you can see there's lots of pages, um, lots of words, and mine doesn't have any pictures. Maybe yours does. But this is a big book. It says a lot of things. It's about a lot of things. There's a lot of people in it. And if you're anything like me, you sometimes wonder, how can we even know what this is all about? So today, we are going to be looking at one verse uh, that does a pretty good job of summing things up. And this is uh, the verse John 3.16. So this is in the Gospel of John in the New Testament, chapter 3, verses 16. And I'll read it for you a couple of times. So it goes... For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. And I'll read it again so we can just let it sink in a little bit. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Now, I'm just going to point out two things in this verse, because, again, it does a pretty good job of summing up some things. How does, the first thing is, how does this verse start? Does it say, for God was so angry at the world, for God was so sad about the world, for God didn't care about the world? No! It says, for God so loved the world. It begins with love. All things that God does begins in love. And now the second thing is, well, who, who is God loving? Uh, does it say, for God so loved uh, pizza? Uh, for God so loved uh, elephants, but not the other animals? For God so loved my family, but... Uh, for God so loved only my church, for God so loved only me, but not you, or you, but not me. No, for God so loved the world so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Everyone. God's love is for everyone. And those are two good things to remember, even as we deal with how big this book is and how much it says. All things begin in God's love, and God's love is for everyone. Will you please pray with me? Holy and gracious God, thank you that you do all things in love and that your love is so big that it includes the entire world. May you help us in showing your love to your creation. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, one year ago, we gathered together to worship and pray. We gathered vaguely aware of the changes and fears happening around us. We gathered as carefully as we could, clinging to our usual ways of being together, unaware of the speed of change, ignorant of the fragility of our lives. One year ago, pandemic swept across the globe. Little could we have imagined what would change, how fast it would change, how strange it would feel, and just how long it would go on. One year on, it seems important to pause, to give space to notice not only where we have come from, 
but where we are and where we are going. So we pause to acknowledge our losses and griefs. We pause to acknowledge our anger, our fatigue, our frustration, and our fear. We pause to remember what is missing, who is missing, what has been altered, the things we long for. We pause to name the lessons we have learned, the new skills, values, and abilities that have come with adaptability. We pause to look around, to be reminded of what is most precious, the values that we have recovered, the spaces we have found anew, the reminders of what really matters most in this life. Holy One, while we grieve, we are grateful. While we weep, may we also dance. Today, as we pause, Grant us the strength that we need to continue the journey together in faith. We pray these things in Christ's strong name. Amen. Our Hebrew scripture reading comes from Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 to 9. Listen now for the word of the Lord. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Our New Testament reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Listen now for the word of the Lord. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment 
that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that in their deeds that have been done in God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O come, Holy Spirit, come as the fire and burn. Come as the wind and cleanse. Come as the light and reveal. Come as the water and refresh. Holy God, convict us and convert us and consecrate us until we are holy and completely yours. Amen. <clears throat> well, today's sermon is part three of a three-part sermon series entitled Satan, a Biography. I know how much you've been looking forward to this final installment of this uh, sermon series in which we've been reflecting upon the character of Satan, the figure of Satan, as that figure appears in various places throughout the scripture, although in different forms and under different names. And we focus mostly on the very first appearance of that character in Genesis chapter 3, the story of the Garden of Eden, where that uh, figure appears in the form of the serpent. Um, and, and we're sort of doing that because the way that we observe uh, this character tells us something about the nature of evil, the again and again pattern of evil that repeats itself uh, in all times and cultures and places. And I want to begin this morning by reminding us of the question that I posed at the very beginning of this sermon series. Uh, how do we, as people of faith, understand the nature of evil and respond to it? Um, and I want to suggest that a way to get at that question for today is to ask and explore yet another question. Namely, how does God deal with evil? And we can tell uh, how uh, this character, the personification of evil, Satan, deals with evil by observing that character. But how does God respond to evil? Now, just an aside, in speaking of evil, I, I want to make clear I'm not speaking about natural evil, which has to do with um, earthquakes, floods, a pandemic, accidents, those things that create human suffering as part of nature. Uh, we're talking about the, the kind of evil that proceeds from the human personality. How does God deal with that? Well, to do, do a little review, um, the first, in the first sermon... Uh, the idea was that God doesn't deal with evil by trying to kill it. The trick that evil often plays upon us is to try to externalize evil and to try to get rid of it by getting rid of you, creating scapegoats. Uh, evil was part of creation from the beginning. Uh, Satan, as we observed in uh, the book of Job, is a part of God's counsel. Uh, and so Evil is not depicted as some force against which God is battling, a battle between, a cosmic battle between good and evil. God doesn't deal with evil by trying to destroy it. You might say that there was a time when God tried that strategy, the flood, Noah's Ark. Let's just wipe out all the bad people and start over again with some supposedly good people. Well, that didn't quite work. And so, no, that's not how God deals with evil. Last week we talked about how this word subtle in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 uh, as disclosing the nature of evil. It's tricky and subtle. And we explored how, you know, Satan actually kind of told the truth. When Adam and Eve ate that fruit, their eyes were opened and they attained something that was very much like God. Knowledge of good and evil, a conscience. And so last week we talked about how do we deal with evil as people of faith? We use our conscience, this thing that is like God that we have as an endowment to tell good from evil. Um, and so, in a certain sense, you might say that God then uses evil 
for the purposes of good. And this is a very strange and mysterious idea. How does God deal with evil? Well, actually, the mystery is that God uses evil to deal with evil. And today we're going to try to make sense of that idea as we explore the mystery of the cross. God uses evil, the cross, to redeem us. How is that possible? Let's begin by exploring this very weird scripture uh, that Linda, Linda Mossung read for us from the book of Numbers. We don't often read anything from the book of Numbers, but the lectionary has assigned this to be read today, along with the passage from John that Rachel read. Um, let's just uh, look at what happens before this episode that we heard this morning from the passage. The people are wandering in, in the wilderness, but God gives them their very first victory uh, as they look toward the promised land. They, they have this incredible victory over the Canaanites. And then what do they do? Do they rejoice? Do they thank God? No. They complain. They complain about their circumstances and their dissatisfaction with life. Here's the irony in the text. They, they say to Moses and God, why did you bring us here in this wilderness to die? And then it reads, for there is no food and water, and we detest this miserable food. Do you get the irony there? There's no food and water, and we hate this horrible food. There is food. They just don't like it. God provided for them manna from heaven. They didn't have to work for it. They didn't have to do anything for it. It was there to provide for their life. But they were dissatisfied with it. That might give us a clue as to the nature of evil. What evil requires as fertile ground to take root? Dissatisfaction. Adam and Eve had everything in the garden. God's love, most foremost, uh, but they were dissatisfied and chose uh, to rebel, uh, chose something more interesting than that, uh, to transgress the boundary that God had set. And so people complain. And there's a consequence for this transgression. And that consequence is death. Now here's where we might see a sort of parallel between that story and the story that we've been studying, Genesis chapter 3. People rebel, they transgress, and death enters the picture. In this case, in this story, and this might ring some bells for us in the form of fiery serpents. Once again, this figure appears. The figure of Satan represented by the serpent in Genesis 3 and represented in this story as that which brings death to the people of God in the wilderness. They're stung as a consequence of their rebelliousness. Charles Spurgeon, the great 19th century Baptist preacher, I read his sermon on this text, this very strange text, and uh, Charles Spurgeon was an amazing preacher. People would come for miles around to hear him preach, and he goes to town with this text from Numbers. Um, you all, by the way, are really lucky. I mean, this is maybe a 20-minute sermon. Those sermons back then were about 90 minutes uh, at the shortest. But in that sermon, Charles Spurgeon uh, draws out in great detail what's meant by the symbol of the serpents, the fiery serpents in the wilderness that bite the people of God as a result of their misbehavior. Uh, in vivid detail, describes the attempt to fill the God-shaped hole that represents our dissatisfaction with that which is not God, with alcohol, chemicals, stimulation, or money, greed, or maybe taking a shortcut toward our satisfaction by cheating on our taxes, on our spouse. So many things that we do out of the dissatisfaction of our life that's represented by this behavior called sin. And what happens? It never satisfies, and it comes back to bite us, literally in this story. 
Uh, Charles Spurgeon points out that this behavior is essentially self-destructive. Our evil is essentially self-destructive. We could talk about this in terms of the law of karma, to borrow a concept from Eastern spirituality, Buddhism, and Hinduism. What is karma but sort of the moral laws of physics that govern the universe? You drop a stone in a pool of water and the ripples emanate. That's our action. The moral aspect of any action has effects. Uh, and usually those effects, if it's evil, accrue to us. What goes around comes around. You reap what you sow. The evil deeds that you perpetrate will come back to bite you. And that is the tragedy of our human personality. So what happens in the story? You know, the people, uh, get, they get the memo. Um, uh, they're being bitten by these poisonous snakes that are symbolic of evil and the consequences of evil. And they ask Moses, uh, could you please intercede for us to find sort of a way out of this situation? We need the cure. And indeed, Moses does intercede with God. And God tells Moses to do something very strange. God tells Moses, make a serpent of bronze. Now, first of all, this seems very strange. Make a graven image, which is... Uh, forbidden in the religion of ancient Israel. But God nevertheless tells Moses, make a serpent of bronze and put it on a staff. And if one is bitten, they can look upon the staff and they will live. This is very strange. The very thing that afflicts them is the source of their healing. What do we make of that? Mary Healing, who teaches scripture at Sacred Heart Seminary in Detroit, writes this. Surprisingly, she writes, the method of cure devised by God is also symbolically linked to the sin. That which heals is shaped like that which caused the wound. Have you ever noticed, and here I'm looking at Chris Allers, who is a medical doctor in addition to being a scientist. If, if you have an EMT visit you, God forbid that happens, but... Um, uh, an EMT or a doctor often has a symbol uh, that we're all familiar with uh, that is this very same symbol, a serpent wrapped around a staff. Um, this is the staff associated with Asclepius, the uh, figure in ancient Greece uh, known to have introduced medical science and used the same method of healing, a staff, a, a serpent twined around a staff. And it's interesting, scholars think that maybe that came from the ancient Greeks to the Hebrews or vice versa, but this symbol uh, is present in many different religious cultures, the symbol of a serpent wrapped around a staff. Because the idea is that the poison is the cure. The word pharmakon in Greek has two meanings, that word from which we get pharmaceuticals, pharmacy, pharmacology. Uh, that word in ancient Greek means both medicine as well as poison. This is the concept in medicine is that a little bit of the poison is what cures us. That's actually how vaccines work. Now you take a little bit of the vaccine as a way to fight the vaccine, to trick the immune system into attacking and destroying the vaccine. And this is what Jesus says about himself to Nicodemus. The same thing. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And by this he means his crucifixion, lifted up on a cross. That all who look upon it and who believe will attain eternal life. The cure to the, to the disease is the disease. This is the mystery of the cross. God uses evil to defeat evil. Now, how do we talk about that? The paradox of the cross. It's a mystery. It's difficult to talk about. In some ways, maybe you'll be walking down the street and you'll somehow realize the essence of that mystery 
which is difficult to speak of, but we have to speak of it. So here are some ideas about how we might understand that mystery represented by Moses' serpent in the wilderness lifted up. To look upon it is to be saved. To look upon the cross is to be saved. How do we think about that? Well, the first thing we might make note of is the fact that God exposes evil by means of the cross. What is the cross but a great no to the human evil we again and again commit? The Romans used crucifixion uh, a kind of under the delusion uh, that we talked about in the very first sermon, that the way to deal with evil is to kill it. And what is the summum bonum of our society but the government and order, Roman order? And so how do we keep order? Well, uh, we kill those people who get in the way. And uh, crucifixion was a very, very creative way of doing that. It was reserved only for those people who were accused of sedition, of trying to overthrow the government. This is the reason Jesus was killed. He was a threat to the state. So what do we do? We kill him, and in a most spectacular fashion, using a cross, which is a giant billboard that says, please don't do this or this will happen to you. How do you deal with evil? You use fear to deal with it. The thing is, it didn't work. Somehow people who came to believe in Jesus saw something different. First of all, they saw that we committed the most evil thing we could ever commit. We killed God in the form of the Son of God on a cross in the most cruel fashion. And therefore, we can never do the same thing without understanding the evil that is exposed through the cross. You know, I think about what happened, the phenomenon that followed George Floyd's death. We all saw, looked upon Eric Chauvin kneeling on a man's neck for nine minutes. And we couldn't react in any other way than to find horror in that act, to see the evil exposed in that act, to see George Floyd and see Jesus, an innocent victim. That's the effect of the cross on culture. We can never commit that funny business without understanding that that's what the Romans did to Jesus. So the cross exposes the evil that we commit again and again, a great no to our attempt at eradicating evil by means of evil. So what else might we say about the mystery of the cross? That it's on the cross that instead of God killing the evil in us, God takes that evil upon God's self. All of the suffering that we create for ourselves, God takes on and nails upon the cross. Charlotte Price, I read a blog that she wrote in preparation for this sermon. And it's a blog that's about people who uh, find their way to Christian faith, in this case, Catholic faith. And she spoke as part of that journey about her nephew's death, her nephew who died by suicide by jumping off a building in Brooklyn. And this is what she writes. My nephew's death was one, one mess I could not clean up. For the first time ever, I didn't even try. My sister and brother-in-law's pain was too great, and my nephew had been married with a two-year-old son. Whereas suicide leaves unanswerable questions, there was nothing to do but accept my own absolute powerlessness. Very soon, images of Jesus on the cross began to appear to me. Perhaps it was because my nephew's death was, so, was also physically violent, but I'd close my eyes, and there would be my nephew broken on the sidewalk. Then there would be Jesus hanging from the cross. For the first time ever, the crucifixion made sense. So the cross exposes our evil. The cross is the means by which God takes onto God's self our suffering and our evil. 
But for those who believe in Jesus Christ, to look upon the cross is to look upon yet something else. Love. What was there in the beginning, in the garden. The only way to disclose the depths of God's love was to suffer with and for us on the cross. That's the irony. The cure for this poison that we've all ingested is love. Love displayed by means of evil, the evil of the cross. So when you look at the cross, you see all those things. You know, Charles Spurgeon in that sermon accuses uh, preachers of trying to make all of this sound reasonable and, uh, you know, sort of prettying it up with nice language. But you know what? This is what it's all about, just this simple thing. To look upon the cross and to receive that cure that God has for us, which is simply this, that which is there for us in the beginning, that which is for us, with us, again and again, love. Amen. pray. God of light, we come to you today seeking the gift of your light and your presence in our lives. Some of us prefer to linger in the shadows where we cannot see your light trying to break in. Our eyes are drawn down to suffering pain and the wounds we inflict on others and ourselves. Others of us feel isolated and alone and struggle to feel your nearness. Some of us are so weighted down by the knowledge of our faults and shortcomings that we feel separated from your promises and your love for us. Holy One, when we feel that we are lost as a people or as a person, help us remember your presence in our wilderness journeys. For you love us, even when we are the most unlovable, lost, and afraid. God, we also need our eyes to be lifted Lift our eyes to see the signs of your life among us, to the touch of your healing on our souls, to Christ on the cross that casts a liberating shadow across all human affairs. We need our eyes to be lifted, God, again and again, so our hearts may be filled with faith and hope and love. 
in the shadow and in the light. We bring ourselves before you, Lord, and all whom you love, who are on our hearts today, who grieve, struggle, or rejoice. We offer these prayers now in the silence. May your light and love surround us Embrace us and sustain us this Lenten season, Lord. Though we remember we are dust, and to dust we shall return, we remember that we are your precious dust, and we love you right back. We affirm these things with the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, each of us has talents to share and resources to invest in God's service. In thankfulness, let us bring our gifts and ourselves as an offering to God. There are numerous ways to do so. Through the blue donate link on our church homepage, through a link in today's chat, or by sending a check through the mail to the church at 2688 Main Street. Let us now reflect and share our offerings to God.
God, receive this offering as a symbol of our gratitude. When we feel like complaining, help us indeed to rejoice and give thanks for all of your blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We ask that you would gift us with that grace that might enable us truly to live grateful and generous lives. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. Let's take a moment to share a sign of Christ's peace with one another, to your neighbors, uh, anyone you happen to be with, uh, to your neighbors on Zoom, uh, let us share a sign of Christ's peace to one another. And let me try to remember to unmute and then remute after I'm finished. Welcome. Uh, peace be with you, everyone. Tom. Jan. Karen. Barbara, David, Jill, peace. May the peace of the Lord be with you and abide with you now and this week and as Christ goes before you. Let us sing our final hymn, which is When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. We will sing verses 1, 2, and 4. of God, go forth in peace. Know that Christ died for you. Christ came that the world should not perish, but that those who believe might know eternal life. Accept this grace with gratitude. And indeed, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and community of the Holy Spirit be ours both now and forevermore. And let the people of God say, Amen.
If you're on Facebook Live, you might bounce on over to the Zoom channel, uh, where we're going to have a little ceremony. As I said, the word bittersweet so often comes to mind in such moments as this, as we uh, both celebrate the work and gifts that people leave behind as they move on. And so we do that with John. We, we had you in triplicate there for the postlude. <laughs> Maybe that was appropriate. That we, and we kept repeating that over and over again and again. Uh, that was our tribute to you, John. Anyway, it may, may not have been intended, but that was our tribute. Um, and so uh, maybe what we could do is begin by asking you, John, if you could uh, share a little bit about where you're going. Uh, I know that um, you leave with something of a heavy heart, uh, although you're going to stay connected with us as a member and in the short term helping us with our live stream. But uh, say a little bit about where you're going and the position you're taking on. Uh, so the the new position is uh, up in Chatham, New Jersey. The church is called Ogden Memorial Presbyterian Church. I've been uh, processing and putting together their wor virtual worship services, and um, the plan is to be in person 
by next week um, as a soft open, and, um, and then uh, moving forward, hopefully by Easter, um, to a, a more of a normal, well, n still socially distanced um, worship service. Um, I'll be acting as the director of music there, um, uh, playing, <laughs> kind of, it's kind of an et all position, um, where uh, for the short term I'll be singing and playing um, a lot and trying to engage the community of faith at large um, through music to, um, to help supplement the services, um, a service through, through music. Um, through the congregation, as well as um, you know, guest guest musicians and whatnot. So. Great. Well, at this time, I would invite anybody to say words of gratitude. Um, I don't know if the maestro wants to say anything or anyone on Zoom, but you're welcome to do that. And of course, uh, I don't know if you can like make your phone. Uh, well, maybe I can do that if somebody else wants to speak uh, on Zoom. Do you want to say something, Jim? Sure. <clears throat> I'll do that. It's, as Jeff mentioned, it is bittersweet. We've had John with us for over 10 years. He's been a rock in our music department um, as our tenor section leader, and especially over this past year as we've been developing things behind the scenes for virtual worship services during this pandemic time. So we're going to miss him, but we, uh, we wish him well in this new endeavor and uh, know that he's not leaving Lawrenceville, and we will, we will see him at again, so it's not really goodbye, it's just kind of see you later. Well, I'm trying to figure out how to get the Zoom channel so that you can hear it here, so um, I'm going to ask, though, if anybody wants to say a few words, if you're on our Zoom channel, to, uh, to uh, John, and what I'm going to do is have you, maybe you can okay, sure. put that in your, oh, huh? in your left ear as I try to figure out how to get that. Hello? Anybody want to say any words out there uh, in honor of John? Let's see, am I connected? Here we go. Oh, hi, Jan. <laughs> I just talked to you last night. <laughs> oh, it's dangerous. <laughs> I do I do want to um getting an echo of me, so that's kind of weird, but, but I, what I will say is that um, I will, but Jeff and Jim have asked me to stay on virtually. Obviously, I'm going to be here for Easter virtually. You'll, you'll probably still see me and be tired of my face. No, uh, but, yes. no but, but uh, that being said, um, it has been my greatest joy um, being here. This is my New Jersey, this church and the church choir has been my New Jersey church or my New Jersey family, if you will. I'm not originally from New Jersey. So in my greatest time of you know, need of maybe of employment and needing engagement, uh, this church brought me in. This past year, um, uh, it's just also been so rewarding. I've poured my heart, soul, and whatnot uh, into these services, into these music videos. And uh, we, uh, to be on, frank, frank and honest, we hit, uh, Fabian lost her employment over this past year, and this is kind of what spurred me pursuing another job. It had nothing to do with actually um, my enjoyment from this, this um, position. I really, you know, every, every single person in this church has been so welcoming. And I always, you know, when I see a person's face or when I all remember the things that we've said and whatnot, 
I'll pop into uh, church choir on Thursdays because I don't have a church rehe uh, church choir rehearsal in my new position, which is kind of nice. Uh, <laughs> so I'll still Sweet. pop uh, I'll still pop in on Thursdays, and um, and we won't be strangers. I know Fabian, my my spouse, and I have talked been in contact with Jeff, and um, we're still planning to be members and um, do some type of fundraising in the future. S um, still yet to be seen, but yes. Uh, we're very grateful for that. Anybody else want to say a word or two? Uh, we have a presentation we're going to make in a moment, but I want to give a chance for anybody who might want to say something here on Zoom. Anybody else? Well, we have a presentation of a gift, the most fungible kind of gift. Um, it's a very small token of our gratitude for your service over these many years, John. Um, I echo the words that have been said about not being a stranger to us and staying in touch with the ministry and um, just know how grateful we are for all of the contributions that you've made um, to this Motley crew the Good Ship Presbyterian Church of Lawrenceville. Yeah. So, God's blessing. Let's pray. Holy God, we ask that you would bless John uh, and Fabienne and their entire family on their way. Uh, as John takes on a new position, may you prosper the work of his hands and heart and voice, um, and that may he indeed be a blessing to the congregation that he will be working with, as he also continues to serve here. God, we give thanks for all the ways you give us means to serve you through the ministry in this church and ministry in all of our lives and our work. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Thank you. This concludes our celebration of John. Go with God. Thank you, Jeff. All right. Thank you, everyone.